Did you have a situation in which, while engaged in what you thought was unusual behavior with regard to coming to visit you? Yes, um, there were two instances. One day Lyle came and sat, sat in my office in full view of kids that would be passing in, in the hallway, but he sat there. And so uh, I tried to elicit something from him. And uh, to be honest with you, there was no exchange. There were no words exchanged for 30, 40 minutes. And I wondered what it was, what this was all about. No other student had ever done this. Eric is one year younger than I am, and Lyle is one year older. And was, do you have a younger sister? Mm-hmm. I have a sister who's a year younger than Eric, then it's Eric, myself, Lyle, and my older sister. Okay. We're all one year apart. And your older sister's name is? Fern. Fern. And your younger sister's name is? Joy. Okay. And would all of you get together, the whole family, all the kids and both of the parents? Yeah, always all together. Okay. And do you remember playing with Lyle and Eric when you were young? All the time. And what do you remember about Lyle? What was he like as a young child? Uh, we were always playing sports with him. He was great in sports, very, very dynamic, uh, really charming and polite, even as a kid. Um, he was very kind. He was uh, protective of my sisters and I. Was uh, the Menendez a family that valued winning? Very much, yes. And when you played with Lyle and Eric, did you choose up teams? We always had the same teams. Uh, Lyle and Joy would play against Fern, Eric, and myself. And Lyle would always say that Joy had to be on his team. Joy was really too little to play at the time. And he would always say that she had to be on his team because she was the best and he couldn't play without her. And it was, it was just nice because she was really too young to play. And they always won. Did you have an opportunity to observe Lyle and Eric's behavior? in their home? Yes. Did you have an opportunity to observe their behavior also outside the home? Yes, we often went shopping with them or to restaurants with them. And do you remember an incident when you were shopping with them in a shoe store? Yes, I do. How old were you? We all still lived in New York, so I couldn't have been older than eight. So that would have made Lyle nine and Eric seven at the at oldest. The oldest. And do you think it may have been younger, or do you think that that? It may have been. And what happened in the shoe store? Um, Lyle and Eric were running around like they usually did, really, really rowdy. And uh, I was just sitting on the bench. Our parents were there, and I wasn't allowed to run around with them. Was Mary Lou there? Yeah, Mary Lou and my mother were there. They were trying on <laughs> shoes. And did Mary Lou do anything to stop them from running around? No, she didn't seem to mind. And did anybody get hurt? Eric got hurt. When he was running around, he tripped and hit his head on the shoe rack, and he cut his head. And did uh, his mother seem to be upset about that? Not overly upset. I, I know he needed stitches. I remember my mother commenting that Mary Lou finished buying her shoes before we took him on to the hospital. Was... Uh, Mrs. Menendez an, an organized, calm person, or how would you describe her? No, she was always late and always kind of rushing around, and everything was kind of always a mess. Can you describe Eric for us? Um, Eric was always quiet and kind of gentle. He was very quiet. Um, I always thought of him as a lot younger. Okay. 
And you said that you were all a year apart in age, is that correct? That's correct. And were you also a year apart in school? Well, in the beginning, were you all a year apart in school? In the beginning, we were all a year apart in school. And then did something change? Yeah, it was in the, in the house in Pennington. I remember talking to Eric about school, and all of a sudden he was in the same grade as my little sister. And I knew he'd always been a grade above her, and I kept saying, of course you're not in that grade, you're, you're a year below, below me. And he and Lyle were both saying no, that he'd always been in that class. And I was really confused, and on the way home I asked my parents about it, and they said that I was correct that Eric had been one year behind me, but that Mary Lou had mentioned possibly keeping him back because he wasn't a straight-A student. But Lyle, I, but Lyle, I assume that's what had happened. But Lyle and Eric were both telling you that... Yeah, they both kept telling me that he was always in that class. Was it important to be strong in that family, to be tough? Definitely. So if you were in the living room, you'd be looking down a flight of stairs, a landing, and another flight of mm -hmm. stairs. Is that correct? Correct. And Lyle was hanging from the living room over the stairs. He was hanging on like this. About how old would he have been? Again, it was in the New York house, so I guess he couldn't have been older than nine. And uh, he got scared, and he asked his dad to take him down. And his father said, no, you'll stay up there till you learn to be strong and learn to be a man. And Lyle started to cry. And I remembered it because I'd never seen him cry before that. And his father started to, to jab him in the stomach and say, you'll stay up there till you learn not to cry. And did he stay up there? For a while, at least. I don't remember how he got down. Was he crying? Yes, he was. What was his father doing while he was crying? Just poking him and poking him in the stomach and saying, you'll learn not to cry. You'll stay up there till you're not afraid and you'll be a man. And where was his mother? She was standing there next to me. Did she say anything to him, like, let him down, he's crying, he's scared? I don't remember her saying anything. And did you ever see her say anything after that to Jose about what he had done to Lyle? Oh, no, she didn't seem to mind it. Did you have a discussion with Mary Lou with regard to what she wanted to do about the, the child care situation for her young son? Yes. And Lyle was born in January, is that correct? Yes. So this would have been when he was just an infant, is that correct? To the best of my recollection, yes. Okay. And what was her proposal with regard to child care for Lyle? She said that it was it didn't seem to make sense to, the arrangement that they had did not seem to make sense to her in that she was gone a good part of the day when she was working, would just come home and see Lyle in the evening and it was very hectic coming home after work and taking care of him. She thought it would be a better arrangement to have Lyle stay with his grandmother and that she and Jose could visit him Friday en route to skiing and then Sunday en route home. And she wanted to know what I thought about that. And what did you tell her you thought about that? I told her I thought it was an awful idea. And did uh, Jose uh, have any input on this? She told me Jose thought it was an awful idea. So I take it that uh, Lyle did not go then to his grandmother's, is that correct? Correct. Was Mary Lou a, a timid kind of person, shy, or was she something else? Absolutely not timid nor shy. Was she fearless? Very fearless. You said that you saw her as being fearless. Did you see that same character trait translate into her as a parent? Yes. Okay. yes. Can you tell me what things you saw that led you to believe that she wasn't <laughs> protective? There were many incidents that I could recall. Um, there was one incident. Their house in Muncie had a porch with a, uh, a railing, and it had a thin railing. I really don't know how high off the ground it was. I, I have no measurement that I could come to. I know that. Uh, Lyle was walking on this ledge and I screamed out to Mary Lou to get him down. 
it seemed to me that if he were to fall, he could hurt himself, and that the ledge was too narrow for him to be walking on. And she just said, he's not going to fall. He, he doesn't fall when he walks on the ground, and he's not going to fall on the ledge. Now, how old would Lyle have been at that time? Five. I have a vague recollection of Lyle again walking where there was a deep drop. And uh, in this particular incident, my husband Peter, who is less protective than I, uh, said to Mary Lou, get him off of there. He can really hurt himself if he falls. And she just said he's not going to fall and let him go on. Uh, it was the first swim lesson that he had. Um, it was, he was involved and um, my daughter Fern and Jessica. Uh, I would say that he was maybe six years old. I'm going to guess at that age. Okay. And what happened with that incident? We, our class was scheduled the first thing in the morning and um, the pool was cold and Lyle, when they went in, Lyle came out crying and he said he didn't want to go in because the water was too cold. And Mary Lou just said, you have to go in. And he kept trying to come out and she kept pushing him back in. He said, you'll get used to it. Did the coach make some comments to Mary Lou to which she responded? In your yes. Okay, and what did the coach say? The coach said to stop pushing him. She, she said, what do you want to do, raise a champion? And Mary Lou said, yes, of course. Was there an incident with uh, Eric in a real estate office which reflected a lack of caring or protectiveness? Yes. When, Vegas, when, I'm sure you'll specify that. Yes. How old was Eric at this time? It was when they were looking for the Muncie home. So if the, do we know what year they moved into the home if, in Muncie? And then if we, Eric if, was born in 1970 and they moved into Muncie in 1972. Then Eric was two years old at the time. We were in a realtor's office. Uh, their family and my family, and the office was located on Route 59, which is a major street, major highway almost. And we were talking to the realtor, and somebody came carrying Eric in, and he had they had to stop the traffic. He had been out on Route 59, and how had did wandered off to, onto the street. How did uh, Mary Lou react to that? Did she seem distraught or upset? No. And what was the incident with the cemetery? Jose had taken Lyle and Eric to a cemetery when it was dark, and, um, and then on some signal, apparently, he and Lyle ran out of the cemetery and left Eric there. And Eric was crying, and they wouldn't go back and take him out for a while. And was there any explanation given for why this would have been good behavior, good parents? They said he had to learn not to, that Eric had to learn not to be afraid. Eric, we were once in a shoe store and Eric fell and cut his, I think it was round over here, and he had to get stitches. And how did Mary Lou react to that? She was not upset about it. Uh, the, shoe, the shoe clerk and I were urging her to have it seen by a doctor because we thought it needed stitches. She and finished buying her shoes? She finished buying her shoes. Was Eric held back? Mary Lou um, asked me several times, Mary Lou told me several times that she thought that she should hold Eric back because he wasn't at the top of his class and she wanted to know my opinion about that. I kept telling her that I, that I didn't think being at the top of the class 
Mary Lou was concerned that Eric was not at the top of his class. Right. Did she say what she was thinking about doing about that? She wanted to hold him back. She felt that if he were older, he could do better. And at some point, did you discover that Eric was in your the same grade as the daughter that you have who's a year younger than him? Yes. And, and yes. And did you talk to her about that? Well, she had mentioned um, we were just sort of reviewing, it was the start of the year perhaps, and we were just saying, this child's in fifth grade, this child's in sixth grade. And when I mentioned the grade that Eric was in, she said, no, what are you talking about? He's in, and I believe it was sixth grade. And I said, no, he's a year ahead of Joy, that's not possible. And she said, he was always in the same grade as, as Joy, they're always in the same class. And I just dropped it at that, realizing that she had followed through on her plan to keep it back. And then she denied it to you? Yes. Was Mary Lou uh, an affectionate, demonstrative mother? No. And when they were leaving, uh, Mary Lou kissed Jamie and hugged her goodbye. Had you ever seen her kiss or hug her own son? N not that I can remember. And was winning important to them? Winning was very important. They cheated, and especially Mary Lou would cheat, whether it would be at Monopoly, whatever. She would cheat. They were going to teach us to play bridge. Peter and I did not know how to play bridge, so we had four open hands. And Mary Lou was cheating, and I kept telling her that it was ridiculous for her to be cheating at a game that didn't matter. We were just learning. But she was cheating. Did you ever? let the Menendez parents take care of your children? No, I never, I never did, I never, I just never felt that they, that it would, would have been Mary Lou, and I never felt that she would have uh, watched them carefully. I, and she often asked me, because I would watch her children, sometimes just for a couple of hours, one time for a week when they went away on a business trip, and uh, she often would say, you'll watch my boys, how come you leave your girls with me? And I just made excuses. I would not have felt comfortable leaving my children with her. She did not watch them carefully. I knew that if they were there, they would be free to do almost anything. There'd be no one really, would, there would be nobody watching them. And at a certain age, I felt the children had to be watched. And Mary Lou specifically said that it would be unwise for them to have friends, that it would take too much time away from the things that were important, and she would say that if they became friends, it would, they would lose the competitive edge in tennis. Did you ever drive with Mary Lou? Yes. Was that an exciting experience? It was a frightening, it was often frightening. She drove 85, 90 miles, if the road permitted it. She went as fast as she could, recklessly. We went from New York to Washington, yes. And, and did you drive with them on that occasion? Yes. And is there anything memorable about that drive? <laughs> it was, we just seemed, at 85 miles an hour, I just stopped looking at the speedometer. It was just uh, frightening. It's very frightening. All written by you, is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Nobody can read it, but it's written by me. All right. And the first report is written on October 14th, 1979, That's correct? true. And without going into the detail of that report, is it true that it's a negative report? Uh, one could say that. And in fact, you underline certain Yes, I did. Letter, letters and words to emphasize that, in your view... And I wrote them in block capital letters, yes. And indicating that uh, Lyle must be prepared for class. He must be... Must hand in his assignments. You see, you can't read it either. I can't, <laughs> sir. And he must concentrate in class. Yes. Indicating he was having problems in those areas. Yes. Just tell us whether that's a bad grade or a good it's, grade. It's uh, marginally bad. It's, right. it's below average. Now. The next report, which is on page two, is dated March 1st, 1980, correct? Yes. 
and you gave him an improved grade at that yes. point. Yes. And also the report itself is improved with some minor criticism, uh -huh. correct? Uh-huh. And the last report dated June 5th, 1980, is also uh, has a grade of 3B, which is an improved grade. Yes, and that's for the uh, 3B for the term and 3 for the, for the year, which means average. And that report appears to be favorable, correct? Yes. The reports on the first page, I, I think you've established, are, are fairly negative in tone. Yes. And the one that was written on March 1st, 1980, is more positive in tone. Mm -hmm. Is there something that happened between the writing of those first three reports and the writing of the report on March 1st, 1980? Uh, yes, there is. And could you tell the jury what happened in terms of your interaction with either Lyle or his parents? Did you have a conference with uh, Lyle Menendez's parents? Yes, I did. And was that conference held on what's called parent-teacher night? Yes, it was. Uh, and they were late. The appointment, I think, was somewhere like 10.30 in the evening. They came in rather. Uh, I was leaving the building. Uh, as I remember, and they came in and, and, and um, accosted me. That would be a, a good word to use, I think. And Mr. and Mrs. Menendez had the last appointment, and they were late, so I presume they were not coming, and then they arrived, and as I was saying, they accosted me. All right. Where, where do you think you're going, kind of thing. And where did they accost you? Were you in outside, the class? Outside the school. So you actually were leaving yes. the building? Yes. And were you heading for your car? Or for yes, I was heading for my car. And at that point, they accosted you? Yes. We went that, then went back into the building, into the dining room, where the, where the conferences were, take, were taking place. And uh, I mean, I didn't, have a, I didn't feel as if I had a whole lot of choice. Uh, I was, uh, I don't quite know whether I was intimidated, but I certainly had never been spoken to in all my umpty ump years of teaching in the way that Mr. Menendez spoke to me. I wasn't, I felt I was a professional. I am a professional. I didn't, uh, I didn't think I should be treated that way. Describe as succinctly as you can uh, <laughs> Sorry, <can't>. Mr. Menendez's <laughs> tone of voice when he accosted you. Belligerent, demanding. And what was he demanding? That I give him the conference that was his due, whatever the time. And what was Mrs. Menendez's participation at that point? Minimal. Was she more or less in the background? Yes. And did uh, Mr. Menendez prevail upon you to return to the classroom? Uh, of course. At that point? And did you, in fact, sit down with him at that point and have a discussion? Yes, I did. And what did he want from you in terms of this parent? I think he wanted me to appreciate the... Uh abilities of his son more than he perceived that I was. Did Mr. Menendez discuss with you the fact that you had written a negative uh, report mm -hmm. yes. on his son? Yes. Did he indicate to you who was responsible for the low grade which you had given oh, definitely. his yes. son? Who did he say was responsible for Me. the low grade? Me. Did he say how you were you were responsible for? No, I was his teacher, and I should teach him, and I obviously hadn't done my job correctly, otherwise he wouldn't have got this low grade. And did he place this blame on you in a tactful way? No. How did he? Well, I just came out and, 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 and said it. You know, my son can do better. You will make sure that he will. And was this a request of you or a no, command? No, not a request, a demand. And how long did this um, conference last? Oh, it's, uh, it was over as quickly as I could make it, probably five minutes, because I, I was anxious to leave. That you were influenced by Mr. Menendez's belligerent behavior and the way you wrote that report. Yes, sir. yes. How were you influenced? I decided to back off and, and, and not, uh, not to um, be as quite as tough as I might otherwise have been, but I decided I wasn't going to engage in any more um, confrontations or, or communication uh, to avoid Mr. and Mrs. Menendez as much as I could. And that was a way of, de of de dealing with the problem. Now, in your school, did the teachers talk about the parents and the students <coughs> that they were teaching? They were not supposed to, but of course they did. And was it well known in your community of teachers that the Menendez parents were problem parents? Yes. And were you scheduled to teach Lyle Menendez again in the eighth grade? Yes, I was. Did something something happened to prevent you from teaching him? Yes, it did. What happened? 
uh, that uh, Lyle appeared on my class roster and then I was called into the head's office who was, uh, said the Menendez parents have requested for you not to teach Lyle in eighth grade because there was a personality conflict. And so you never Presumably between, I, I don't know whether it was between me and Lyle or between me and, uh, in their perception, between me and Lyle. And so you didn't teach him in I was delighted grade. not to. As good as he played on the field, he wasn't always a member of the team because of his other priorities. You said he gave 125% on the field. What was he like off the field, around the other boys that you were coaching? He was usually in and out very quickly. He, uh, the other boys liked him, but he didn't reciprocate towards them. He, was, he stuck to himself very often. Was he pretty much a loner? The, uh, the word probably described him well then. Well, his father would come to most of the games, and his father did show up at some practices. And what was the father's behavior like in the presence of Lyle Menendez um, on the field? Domineering. He, was, uh, he spoke with an accent, and the one thing I remember, he would always yell, Lyle, get the ball, get the ball. At times, it wasn't even uh, it wasn't even conducive to the team because it, I would like the players to play in position and not to leave their position to go after the ball. And he didn't always understand this. That, you know, I wanted the player in a certain spot on the field, not worried about where the ball was. But he had this repetitive term, Lyle, get the ball, get the ball. And he would go up and down the sidelines. One time he came up to me and said something in reference to either Lyle's grandfather or his grandfather was a, a professional soccer player in Cuba and that he knew a lot about the game because of that, you know, and that, that he just felt like I, I got the feeling that he thought he knew more about soccer than I did, which he very well may have known, but I just I didn't deal with him. He was... Mr. Menendez was very competitive and he expected his son to give everything he had and some. Did you see him physically do anything in relation to Lyle Menendez during the halftime? I did. He would, he would, he would right away when the whistle blew for the halftime, he would head right for Lyle. The team would come towards me. He would head for Lyle often with a towel. If it's cold out, we played in the winter, possibly some sweats put them on him, dry him off. He, he actually, he actually uh, I, this is a, a little crude to say, but he actually treated Law almost like he was a thoroughbred racehorse, the way he would towel him down at halftime and after the game. But after the game, it was more of a quick thing to let's get you, get you out of here as quick as possible. Often the players and the families would stay around, mill around for half an hour after the game, 45 minutes. But the Menendez family was out of there as quickly as possible. And, and when you say you, he treated him like a racehorse, what do you mean by that? I just mean he it, it, it was more of a uh, more of a property than a son. Mr. Mosner, you coached Lyle Menendez when he was 11 and 12 years old. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And were the other boys uh, on the various teams in which Lyle participated also? 11 and 12 years old. Yes, ma'am. During the times Mr. Menendez came to practices, would you ever see uh, his other son, Eric? Yes, ma'am. I'd say about a half a dozen times. Okay. And would Eric accompany his father and his brother on the soccer practices? He would come to the practice, yes, ma'am. Okay. And approximately how old was Eric? Uh, on these occasions when he came to the soccer practices with his father and his brother? Eric was a couple years younger, but uh, much uh, less developed than the other boys at that time. Okay. Are there, uh, in your experience as a coach, developmental differences between uh, eight and nine-year-olds and 11 and 12-year-olds? Severe. Okay. Uh, are eight and nine-year-olds uh, smaller? Much less. And are they also uh, not as uh, muscular as the older boys? Yes, often much slower also. 
What about their skill level besides no, speed? Nowhere near it. Yes, he asked me on several occasions anywhere from uh, three to six, Eric, if I minded if Eric practiced with the uh, older boys. Okay. And this was Mr. Menendez who made the request, not Eric, correct? Yes, ma'am. I really never, never spoke to Eric. Did uh, Eric, in fact, participate in some practices with the older boys? Yes, ma'am. And did Eric try hard? Tried as hard as anyone. Okay. Uh, in your opinion, Mr. Mosner, was Eric evenly matched with the boys in Lyle's age group? Seriously overmatched him. He tried hard, he played hard, but he uh, physically couldn't, st couldn't stick up with them. How long were these practices that Eric participated in? Approximately an hour to two hours. Can you tell me what goals you explained to Mr. Menendez in terms of how you ran the program? Um, at that age, at around the, the age of 10 years old, it was, uh, we work on basic strokes development of the kids. Um, we try to make tennis very fun for them and keep them motivated. And what were his goals, if any, that he shared with you at that time? <clears throat> I specifically remember he wanted me, he said that I, I couldn't work Lyle too hard. In other words, he wanted me to really work him physically hard on the court. And he talks Excuse about... Excuse me, you couldn't work him too hard, meaning that he was asking you not to work him too hard? No, 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 just the opposite, that he wanted me to work him very hard, oh. physically. And he made reference not so much to winning but to rankings he had set goals for you know to get ranked in regional uh, tournaments and so forth which is directly related to winning because you don't get ranked if you don't win and how old was Lyle at this time approximately 10 well I worked with Lyle both at the tennis club in the winter months and I also worked with him at their home on their private court outside in the summer months and um, he, when he was in town or when he was done work, he oftentimes came to the court. This was to observe the practices during practices? No, no, he would actually join in. He would come out on the court, which was uh, somewhat unusual. It was very unusual. He, Why was that unusual? Because, um, you know, most of the parents might come and observe a lesson for a short period of time, but you know, I wasn't allowed to actually coach. I mean, I would go out there, that was my job, but he would come out on the court, he would literally walk to the other side of the court, and he was very cordial. He would just interrupt and say, excuse me, and he would go to the other side of the court and start giving instruction to Lyle while I was doing the lesson. And this was while you were supposed to be giving him the lessons as the coach, correct? That's right. Did that create a certain amount of tension between you and Lyle and Mr. M you and um, Lyle Menendez and uh, Mr. Menendez? Yes, it did. Lyle seemed to be both embarrassed and resented what was being told to him. Resented what was being told to him by you or by Mr. Menendez? By Mr. Menendez. In, in other words, he basically took over my lesson, essentially. Did you see Mr. Menendez physically confront in, a, in, in any way Lyle while these lessons were taking place or physically position himself in relation to Lyle? Yes, he would, he would be on the court. Could you describe what you saw? Um, well, as I say, he would walk to his side of the court. Mr. Menendez was a, was a big man and uh, he, would, he would go right up to Lyle, oftentimes take the racket out of his hand and he, he spoke with a, with a slight accent, and he, he would sort of bark instructions. Uh, he spoke very quickly and very firmly in short sentences and sort of bark instructions at Lyle. And what was Lyle's reaction to these barking of instructions? Um, he would, he was very quiet. He wouldn't say anything. He would just look at Mr. Menendez and uh, sort of just stare at him, and he wouldn't say anything. There was very little reaction. Would he ever talk back to him? No. Argue with him? No. He was much bigger than me, but he walked very quickly and he always had his head pointed downward. Um, he spoke abruptly and barked. And I remember 
specifically one of the instructions was to take the ball on the rise and he would go over and say, Lyle, give me your racket. He would take his racket. Take the ball on the rise. Let me show you. And then he would force me to feed some tennis balls to him that he would actually hit. Take the ball on the rise. Take the ball on the rise, Lyle. Hit it this way. So it was barking in very quick, short, abrupt instructions. And he would actually ask you to feed, Mr. Menendez would ask you to feed him balls so that he could then demonstrate what he wanted his son to do. Yes. Okay. And was this unusual in your experience for a parent to uh, involve himself in coaching in this particular? Unusual and insulting. What would Mr. Menendez do if, if Lyle Menendez did something wrong on the court, hit a bad shot, or did something that Mr. Menendez did not like? Um, most of the time, I mean, if he was off the court, he uh, would just make different facial expressions. Uh, he stared. He stared a lot at, at just about everything Lyle did on the court. How would you describe the facial expressions that he made to Lyle Menendez? Stern. There was a match one time when Lyle was losing and Mr. Menendez physically went out on the court and uh, interrupted play, which is not allowed, and spoke to the opponent of Lyle that he was foot faulting, which is, which is against the rules, but it was not his place to go out there. What it, when you say it's not allowed and it's not his place to go out there, what is the procedure in that kind of situation? What's supposed to happen? When two 10-year-old boys are playing a match, we instruct them as the tournament directors that if they have some kind of problem, whether it be line calls or whatever, they're to stop the match and call for an umpire, which then one of us goes out on the court and settles their dispute. The boys themselves are supposed to call you out? That's right. And what role, if any, are the parents supposed to be taking in None. this sort of situation? None. And what role did Jose Menendez take in the situation you're describing? He actually went out on the court and spoke to the other 10-year-old boy and told him that he was going to be defaulted from the tournament if he didn't stop foot faulting. And Most parents will watch TV or read the paper or something, not watch 60 minutes of every lesson. Did Jose Menendez, Mr. Menendez, have a reputation for aggressiveness? Yes. Based on your own personal contact with him, did you have an opinion as to whether Mr. Menendez was verbally abusive? Yes, I thought he was, he was uh, very unfair in his treatment. And more so than other parents? Or Absolutely. just about average? Absolutely. How strong of an opinion did you personally have that he was verbally abusive? Very strong. Did you and Mr. Menendez have a basic disagreement on the philosophy of how someone should be taught in the sport? Yes. What was his philosophy and what was yours? Uh, well, his philosophy, as far as I knew, was that the boys should be trained very, very hard and pushed as hard as they could go. And. Uh, and basically, he, his attitude was that he wanted them to try to do things in the development of their game ahead of what I thought was the chronological order of how someone should be taught and progress. If you could explain to the jurors what was wrong, in your opinion, with the way that Jose Menendez wanted these kids coached. Uh, I thought it was cruel. I'm sorry? I thought it was cruel. Okay. Why, how was it cruel? Because they had to physically suffer. And did, uh, did these kids complain about the physical suffering? No. Uh, how did you know they were physically suffering? Because I knew how many hours a day they were doing. And how many hours a day were they doing it? All their free hours. And all day, both weekend days. And was it your um, knowledge that they were uh, playing tennis before they went to school in the morning sometimes? Yes. And did you coach them sometimes before they went to school? Yes. 
And what time would those kinds of lessons begin? 6 a.m., 6.30. What about on days when one or both of the boys uh, didn't feel well? Didn't matter. They had to play and be coached even when they were sick? Yes. Why did you continue to coach them if so much that you didn't approve of was going on? Because I cared for them. And you're rather emotional about this even now, are you not? Yes. Did you feel that somehow your being there was making some kind of difference? Did you think that your remaining as their coach had any impact upon Lyle or Eric's well-being? Yes. And what impact did you think your being there had? Well, I, I thought it was about all they had. In what sense? What do you mean by that? As a, as a friend. Well, m most often, again, Eric would be at the pool for the most part. I remember Lyle being up at the tennis court for the most part, and the tennis court was about 50 yards, I'd say, up a hill from the pool, um, definitely within, within ear sh earshot distance, but, um, but not at the pool itself. But Eric, when he was done at the, I mean, I'm sorry, when Lyle would be done at the tennis court, I remember him coming down to the pool and, and taking a dip here and there. And would Eric be there by himself then during these periods of time? Yes, he would be. And when Lyle was up on the tennis court, would he be up there for an hour or two at a time? It or? seemed that he was up there for much longer periods of time than just an hour. It was, he would be up there, literally, I, from my recollection, would be up there for hours and hours at a time. And again, that was, I thought, pretty atypical because of the the weather and the humidity um, in, in New Jersey. It was probably 90 degrees and close to that in humidity many, very often. And, and to be up at the tennis court that long was, I thought, odd. I do recall Mr. Menendez being up there and, and Lyle hitting ball after ball after ball after ball for, uh, again, I, I don't know the exact length of time because I never really clocked it, but but it was, it seemed to be an, an extraordinary amount of time with, with Mr. Menendez asking him to, you know, hit harder, hit further, hit stronger, hit, you know, whatever. I mean, just hit, 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 hit. And was uh, Eric on the swim team? Eric was on the swim team. And you were the coach? I was one of three coaches. And how often did the swim team practice? We had practice every afternoon. Uh, I think it was about four, four thirty, four thirty to five thirty or so, every afternoon, Monday through Friday. And did, were there swimming meets? There were swimming meets about, I'd say once to twice a week. I don't remember the entire schedule, but it was, there were meets on a weekly basis. And when you had the swimming practice, um, how long would that last? Swimming practice would last about 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. Were the kids tired after it? Yeah, typically it was, we had kids anywhere from age 8 to age probably 13, 14, and it, wasn't, it was a pretty strenuous workout, I and mean, we were getting them to do probably 1,000 plus, 1,500 yards um, at a time. And would there be times after this workout when Mr. Menendez would show up? Yes, Mr. Menendez would sometimes pick the boys up after he'd get home from work, and, and uh, he would jump into the pool after the swim practice was over because the pool was closed for um, general swim at that, at that hour. And he would get in the pool to swim laps and would ask Eric to swim laps with him. And this was, would be right after a, pr a practice. Okay, now, would he ask Eric or? Tell, <laughs> get in the pool and swim laps with me. Did uh, Eric look happy about this? No, I, I couldn't say he looked happy. He looked, he was, relatively exhausted from, from a, a swim practice and then he had to go in and swim more laps. It was nothing that he ever, I don't think he ever looked forward to. Well, the pool closed at 7, so I would say if practice was you know, 4.30 to 5.30, Jose, Mr. Menendez would pick them up you know, maybe around 6 and it would last for about a half an hour or so. And do you remember seeing Mr. Menendez at meets in yes. which Eric was swimming? 
Yes, I do. Both Mr. Menendez, Mr. and Mrs. Menendez would attend the meets. Mrs. Menendez, um, we would we would need volunteers from the members to be officials to act as officials at the meet. So Mrs. Menendez would be an official, a timer, a, a judge of some kind, and and Mr. Menendez would be there um, to watch. And was Eric a good swimmer? Eric was a very good swimmer. He was a naturally gifted swimmer. And. Did he try hard? Yeah, he always tried hard. He was very, very polite, very hardworking in practice. Always listened to the coaches and was, you know, was a, was a very good and hardworking swimmer. When he would swim in these meets, would you see his father do something that struck you as <coughs> unusual? Yes, uh, unusual enough that it was remarked upon by the other. Coaches, Mr. Menendez would be when Eric would be swimming in a race. He would be running up and down the length of the pool, basically yelling at Eric, who is a breaststroker, to you know, swim harder, swim harder, and not in a very positive, reinforcing way, but more in a you know, you're not swimming fast enough, you're not swimming fast enough way. Every stroke, you come up for a breath. So every time Eric would come up for a breath he would hear Mr. Min, his father, yelling harder, harder, or whatever. I mean, it was whatever his comment was at the moment. But it would be for the length of 25 yards or 50 yards. Every time Eric would come up for a breath, he would see Mr. Menendez running up and down the length of the pool, which was, again, no other parents would be doing that. It was different than the kids I had coached before and lifeguarded before. It was much more, it was much, more atypical of this type, this caliber of, of swimming, of competitive swimming. This was a summer league, summer recreation uh, uh, club, and, and they were in a summer league um, swim, competitive swimming situation. And it wasn't by far the most competitive swimming one could participate in. There's much more competitive swimming out there. And this was really for fun. It wasn't, there were medals and ribbons awarded to, to, to the swimmers, but, but typically it was just a fun atmosphere. It should have been a fun atmosphere for the kids that were participating in it. What would happen to uh, Eric when he got to the end of his lane at the end of the race? Mr. Menendez would usually be waiting for him at the end of the at the end of his lane, and Eric, I recall, was a pretty lanky and, and skinny young boy, and he, Mr. Menendez would basically pull him up with, uh, with his thumbs in, in Eric's armpits and take him out of the water, and, and if he didn't like Eric's performance, he would not really aggressively, but, but um, you know, kind of take him out and shake him and say, you didn't swim fast enough, you didn't swim fast enough, you should be swimming harder. And mm -hmm. I have vivid memories of that. Would he do that uh, even when Eric won sometimes? Yeah, I mean, he would do it win, or, win lose, or draw. I mean, yeah, he did that. Do you ever see any other parents lift their children out of the water like that? And no, I would see parents you know, kind of bring them out and hug the kids, whether they came in dead last or won the race. I'd see other parents hug and say, great race. And Did you ever see Mr. Menendez comfort Eric or congratulate him or say anything positive to him? No, it was more humiliation in front of his competitors and, and teammates. And how did Eric look when this happened? Very sad, very sad. He would typically just kind of walk away and, and be very sad about his father's, um, you know, his father's way. And was Mrs. Menendez around at the time? She would be officiating and, and she would have an opportunity to, to go over there and say good race, but she never did. She was on to her next uh, job at, at the pool or whatever. She was, she? Never, she was never there to comfort Eric after Mr. Menendez was was tongue lashing him. Would she ever interfere in trying to tell try to tell Mr. Menendez that it's not the way to treat the boy? No, she just pretty much echoed whatever Mr. Menendez would do. And she never I never saw her support Eric at all. And 
as a teacher there, did you get to know Mr. and Mrs. Menendez and their two sons, Eric and Lyle, who are seated here? Yes, I did. And did you get, did you have contact with them um, by being a neighbor of theirs as well as by being a teacher? Most definitely. We were neighbors twice. Once we lived uh, about four to six blocks away from them. And when we returned, we resumed our relationship with them in 1982 all the way to 1989. And then we were four doors down from them. Okay, so, so we, when you returned in 1982, you lived four doors down from them, yes, is that correct? Yes, on, on the lake. And when the, the Menendez family moved to California in 1986, I presume you stayed in New Jersey, is that yes, correct? Yes, we did. Yes. Did you continue to have contact with the family after they left California? Yes, simply because our family lives here and we would come in December as well as at Easter. And so whenever we would visit, we would let them know that we would be in town and we would meet. Did you have uh, Lyle Menendez as a student of yours? I certainly did. And yes. when was that? That was um, September of 1984 through June of 85. And for half a year um, in 85. No, the first one had only five students. We, we met in a tutorial sort of situation. And what did you teach? I taught um, grammar and composition. English or Spanish? Spanish, of course. You do get to know uh, students when there are only five of them in a class. Okay. Yes. Well, the class met uh, first period, and um, uh, I always saw him coming in a bit late. Um, and at first that bothered me, and then I realized that uh, that was the way things were in his house. And what do you mean that's the way things were in his house? I just, uh, when I first approached him the first few times, uh, it was evident that it was no fault of his that he was late. How would he be dressed when he came in? Tennis clothes. He was always with tennis clothes, even when it was cold. And did you learn that he played tennis in the morning before he came to school? We knew that tennis was a very big part of his day. This class being a grammar and composition class, um, it was required of the students to read some very difficult um, literature. And I would ask them to write compositions. And the compositions that came back to me were wonderful. They were perfectly written. Um, and every so often we'd have a grammar exam and I could not really equate what went on in an exam versus the composition I was getting, which I would imagine would take a lot of critical thinking, a lot of um, knowledge in the language to be able to write that good of a composition. So I, um, in one of the parent-teacher conferences, I did bring it up to Joe and Kitty. Is the short version of what you're telling us is that somebody else was doing the work that was coming from home besides Lyle? Did you have an opinion as to whether Lyle was doing the work that was coming from home? I had an opinion that there was no way that someone with the grammar knowledge that he had would be writing these compositions. What happened in that conversation with his parents about this problem? Yes, he received a two grade. And what is, it, what is the top grade? One. Okay. And they came to see me. And, um, and they asked why the two rather than the one. And I explained that um, he said nothing in class, never spoke, and uh, the grammar wasn't up to par. But the compositions were great, so I had to give him a two, but there was no way that I could, of good conscience, give him a one. And did Mr. Menendez accept this gracefully? Uh, no, not at all, and, and Kitty accepted it even less gracefully. Were they confrontational with you? Extremely so. Were they frightening? Yes. Were they intimidating? Yes. Did you push this, what appeared to be cheating, as far as you might have with another student? Oh, the way that we did things as teachers is we would have academic meetings no less than every two weeks, once a month. And during these meetings, we would bring up students' names. And uh, the students' name would be put on the board, and we would say things that we felt had to be aired. And, and I would bring it up at every academic meeting, at 
every level meeting. And did other teachers have similar problems? Similar or other comments, yes. With regard to both Lyle and Eric? Yes. And was there a general uh, reputation of the parents in the school that affected what decisions were made about what to do about their children? Most definitely. Did the teachers talk about problems that they were having with Lyle and Eric? Yes, they did. And did they talk about problems they were having with the parents? Yes, they did. Did you have any other confrontations with Mr. and Mrs. Menendez about this, this situation with someone else doing Lyle's homework? Did you personally? No, I left it up to the administrators to handle it. And um, why didn't you do it personally? Uh, a, I knew it wouldn't do any good, and secondly, I really didn't welcome confrontational meetings, meetings whereby I would have to be put in, a, in an aggressive position. So I would tell my administrators to call them in and handle it. Okay. I felt they had a lot more power than I would. I did what I could. And was this your response with regard to all parents, or was this just with these parents? No, 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 no. With most parents, we could write notes. They were called interims. With most parents, we would even sometimes pick up the phone and talk. Why didn't you pick up the phone and call Mrs. Menendez and say, you've got to stop this? It wouldn't have worked. Why did you say that Mrs. Menendez was even more confrontational than Mr. Menendez? She could be fierce, she could be rigid in her thinking, stubborn, and, um, and you knew also that, you know, your job could be put at, at, at stake. They, they were intimidating people. They intimidated all of us. All of us meaning the teachers? Teachers, administrators, neighbors. Did you have a situation in which Lyle engaged in what you thought was unusual behavior with regard to coming to visit you? Yes, um, there were two instances. One day Lyle came and saw, sat in my office in full view of kids that would be passing in, in the hallway, but he sat there. And so uh, I tried to elicit something from him. And uh, to be honest with you, there was no exchange. There were no words exchanged for 30, 40 minutes. And I wondered what it was, what this was all about. No other student had ever done this. And did that happen a second time? This happened twice. And was the second visit the same? He just came and sat there? Exactly the same. And did you try to find out what was going on? Well, you try to elicit. You know, you say, hello, how are you? You need help with your homework, etc. You elicit. You try to. But when nothing is forthcoming, you realize that, uh, you know, there's just so far you can go. And I didn't want to make him feel unwelcome. Also, I didn't want to say, well, if you have nothing to say, leave. So I kept hoping that he would say something. You told Mrs. Menendez about Lyle's behavior. Yes. Uh, did Lyle ever come back to your office? Never. Kitty could be um, fierce um, in her stance about things. She could be needy at other times, pathetic, uh, kind of suspicious of people. Um, um, unorganized, would spacey, all, all kinds of contradicting things. Or, or we would go to her house for dinner and we would start helping with the dinner because dinner wasn't quite done or we would have to all engage in helping her cook. Was she uh, athletic? Very athletic. She could beat my husband at tennis. What was her house like? What was the condition of the house? Her house had a lot of animals in it, and I always felt that maybe part of the disruptive quality of the home or the smells had maybe to do with the animals. Um, it, there was a feeling of, of not total cleanliness and, and, and good grooming and good housekeeping attached to it. You mentioned smells? Yes. Animal smells? Yeah, primarily, yes. Unpleasant animal Unpleasant, smells? Unpleasant, yes. Yeah. Joe was e extremely good at intimidating people. He was um, abusive, um, could be cruel to people, even in a social setting, controlling. Uh, I found him destructive at, at times. If a party was going on, he had an edge about him or a, something about him 
that could almost destroy the mood. Very cruel, very sarcastic. Did he appear to be controlling of his wife? Totally. In, how, why do you say that? I never knew of any other couple that uh, when a certain amount of the, a certain time of the day came that he would say, Kitty, you're sleepy, we're going home. Or uh, he would make hand signals when he wanted her to stop talking. Or he would finish a story for her. Did she seem to have a drinking problem? She drank. Was there a uh, situation at a memorial party in which Jose's controlling behavior was demonstrated toward Lyle? We were invited to a picnic at their house and we sat on a bench eating, the four of us, my husband and Joe and Lyle and I. And my husband knew that um, Lyle was ready to graduate in June. This was in May. And we have a son who's now 21. So my husband was trying to engage in conversation with Lyle, much like he does with Michael. And he Michael's was saying, your son? Yes, yes ma'am. He was saying, well, you know, what are your plans and, and what are you going to do in June? And, and no matter what my husband asked, Joe would answer, <laughs> not Lyle. He, would, he just sat there. And, and Mr. Menendez answered every question, which I found extremely odd. How old was Lyle at this time? Lyle was ready to graduate from high school. This was in May. He was graduating in June. That we would have an hour's worth of court time. And, um, you know, we would play from 9 to 10 in the morning or 8 to 9. And in the court next to us, Mr. Menendez and Lyle had court time as well. And uh, I saw that interaction frequently. And what was that interaction like? Um, Mr. Menendez instructed Lyle the whole hour, uh, uh, shouted commands, told him what to do, how to hit the ball, where to stand. Uh, the entire time he spoke. Did Lyle say anything back? Lyle was a total robot. Very, very much like a robot would be. Did you hear a lot of uh, good shots or uh, positive comments? No. When you were living there as their neighbors, yes. was there an incident in which there was a major storm? Yes, it was in July of um, 84. We and lived on a lake, a honey man-made lake, and it it emptied onto a dam, quite a, a nice sized dam, and then it would go on into various creeks all the way into Princeton. We lived in Pennington, and there was this lake which had a dam, and then it flowed, the waters flowed into Princeton. And when you had this storm in July of, of 84, uh, did something happen to the boats? Yes, we had a boat, and we, we realized the storm was coming. We only had a little sunfish. And I remember my husband and our neighbor and my son pulling the boat onto the sand landing and tying the boat. Um, and all our neighbors did the same because the storm was really getting horrible and the waters were rising. And even did with that, the 12 boats went over the dam. You, there was nothing anyone could do. You could just see them, and, and you know, it was just horrible. And were people looking for the boats? A day or two later, uh, everyone began by car with the right uh, instruments, with whatever, to follow the route to see what, you know, what we could uh, gather from these little sunfish boats. And they, they all ended up in little bits and pieces down, down the way. And did something happen in connection for the search for the boats with regard to Eric? Yes, the Menendez had been away that weekend. So when they came back, there were no boats. And so Kitty sent Ly uh, Eric out to look for the boats because she had it in her head that he had not tied the boat correctly and they had lost their boats because of Eric. So she had him looking for the boat alone and was told that he couldn't return home until he found it. And did he come to your house during the course of looking for the boat? Many times. And w did any other families have their children looking by themselves for the boats? No. No, that, that was not the kind of uh, mission you could send a child out alone. Eric came to your house many times. Yes. Uh, was this uh, during the course of his efforts to find uh, the family's boat? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And 
Uh, why was he coming to your house looking for the family's will? Because know? Uh, sustain. Did he, did Eric say anything to you about why he was at your house looking for the yeah, boat? He wanted instructions. What, what what did we do in searching for the boat? He also needed to get dried up every so often. He needed, you know, a little bit of warmth and, and drying up. His his clothing w were wet. Okay, so he, did he. He was asking you what, what your family had done to try and find Absolutely. the boat. Absolutely. And how, over the course of how long did uh, this search occur? Well, last time we saw him, it was very, very dark at night. And that's when I picked up the phone and called Kitty. After the last time that you saw Eric, uh, when it was dark out? I called his mother. And uh, did you ask his mother uh, to do anything in yes. that phone call? Yes. Overall. What did you ask his mother to do? I asked her to first not place the blame on Eric because uh, we all knew what had happened with a storm and 12 boats were lost to no one's blame. And, and second, for Joe or someone to help Eric when it was daylight but definitely not to, to go on with this. And uh, did you then uh, send Eric home? Well, we don't know where he went. We have no idea. In any event, Eric left your house. He, he left our house. And you don't know whether or not he went home or continued his search? I have no idea. Was uh, Mrs. Menendez, when you spoke to her on the phone and tried to explain that it wasn't Eric's fault, sympathetic? Oh, no. No, she was firm about her beliefs. And did she indicate that Eric should continue looking for the boat? Yes, ma'am. In high school. So Eric would have been 13? Probably, yes. Do you remember, now, did that movie stand out in your mind? Tremendously so. Did, do you remember the name of that movie? Yes, I do. And can you first say it and then spell it for yes. us? Yes, Pix Pixote, P-I-X-O-T-E. And you remember that you were shown this film in their home? Yes, I was. And what are comments? Comments are little pieces of paper that every teacher was required to write at each interim marking period and at the end of each marking period, and it was to assess the students' progress. Um, we were The students were given a grade, an academic grade, and an effort grade. And um, when we wrote these, the most important thing for us to do was to tell the student what he was doing well. That was very important. Um, so that the student had some sense of how he was doing them and we were pleased with his work. Um, at the same time, we also felt that we had to be completely honest and tell the student where he was having some difficulty. You indicated that uh, those <coughs> records uh, uh, told you that Eric had had uh, difficulty with auditory processing in the past, is that correct? Yes. Um, are there remedial classes uh, available at uh, PDS for children with learning disabilities or learning differences? Up to the eighth grade. Okay. And uh, is there anything uh, that uh, in those records which indicates that Eric uh, went to a remedial class for his learning difference? Did you uh, ever meet uh, Jose Menendez, Eric's father? Yes. And approximately how many times did you meet Mr. Menendez? Half dozen. Uh, did you meet him uh, at the school or? At school. Other? And uh, were these at parent-teacher conferences? Parent-teacher conferences and back to school night. Okay, and uh, you uh, met Jose Menendez approximately six times. Yes. So I take it that he uh, had more than one parent-teacher conference uh, during the year that uh, you taught Eric? No. Okay. He never came to Eric's. Okay. You 
also taught Lyle, correct? Yes. Okay. How would you describe Jose Menendez based on your contacts with him at these conferences? Belligerent, manipulative, trying very hard to be powerful and in control, rude, nasty. Well, he was never satisfied with Lyle's grades. Uh, he didn't come to Eric's conference. Um, and obviously, I was a terrible teacher because <coughs> Lyle wasn't speaking fluent Spanish because, obviously, Lyle had a Cuban gene. So he, he indicated, he expressed some belief that because uh, Lyle was Cuban, he should be able to speak Spanish. Absolutely. Uh, as a teacher, is that a rational uh, belief in your opinion? Is that how people learn Spanish, because they have a gene that allows them? No. Now, you said that you have been... Uh, a teacher for 24 years. Yes. Okay. And I take it during the 24 years you have uh, seen and met a number of parents of yes. students. Uh, did uh, Jose Menendez stand out uh, among the teacher, uh, the, among the parents that you've met? Was uh, Mr. Menendez uh, frightening to you? Yes. How was he frightening? In what way? He tried to tell me that I did not know what I was doing, that I was a bad teacher, that it was my fault that his son wasn't doing better in school. Uh, did you have uh, conferences about Eric with Mrs. Menendez? Yes. And approximately how many contacts did you have with Mrs. Menendez uh, specifically about Eric? At least two. Okay. And did you have other contacts with her uh, in connection with the two years that you taught uh, the older son, Lionel yes. Menendez. And did you have a chance to observe Mrs. Menendez both uh, in the company of her husband and alone? Yes. And was there a difference in her behavior uh, when she met with you by herself and when she met with you with her husband? A noticeable difference. And what uh, was that difference? Could you describe it for us? When the two of them met together, um, she was rather passive. Um, she let him run the show. Uh, she took copious notes, but almost never spoke. Um, when she was alone, um, she was very defensive, didn't want to hear anything negative about either of the boys, was not very pleasant to deal with. Um, and in fact, although we all told her, myself, over and over and over again that this child needed some extra help, she denied it and would not provide it for him despite the fact that she had all the resources at her fingertips. And this, to me, is a case of pure neglect. Was there anything uh, unusual about Mrs. Menendez's physical appearance? She always came to conferences in, um, I think you call them jogging suits or warm-up suits. Um, she was not as well groomed as most of the mothers that I saw. Um, her hair was usually pretty messy and needed a bleach job. And she had a, a noticeable smell that I was never able to identify. Uh, did uh did it appear to you that uh, it was a smell that might be the result of alcohol consumption? Objection calls for speculation, lack of foundation. Okay, well, uh, you said that she had a noticeable smell. Alcohol was my guess. Uh, do you think that if uh, you are not, if you displease parents, it might jeopardize your job? Yes. Now, was there a difference in that you were able to see in the way the parents uh, related to Eric Menendez and Lyle Menendez. Yes. Okay. Uh, and what was that difference? Well, it was very clear to me um, that Lyle was the favorite son. Um, the expectation level was higher. Um, they expected more of him. They expected a great deal of Eric also, but the time that I knew them, um, Lyle was the golden boy and could do no wrong. Was there a difference between 
the quality of, of the work Eric did as homework and his work in class. Yes. And what was the difference? A huge discrepancy. The work that was turned in from home was always much better than the work done in class. Did uh, that discrepancy cause you to uh, suspect anything? Yes. Okay. And what did, did you suspect? That he might be getting help. Did you understand that Mr. Menendez was Cuban and spoke Spanish? Yes. Did uh, you ever uh, attempt to raise this issue of the discrepancy between the quality of the work in the classroom and the homework with uh, either uh, of the Menendez parents? I don't believe so. Is there a particular reason why you didn't? <coughs> didn't want to upset the apple cart. When you say you didn't want to upset the You didn't want to have Jose become angry for no particular reason. Had you had experiences in the past or heard of experiences in the past which caused you to want to avoid angering Mr. Menendez? Oh, yes. And were those experiences you had or experiences that other teachers had told you about? Both. Let me ask you, Mrs. Sharp, about uh, Eric's attitude towards learning. Um, was he... Uh, a relaxed student? No. How would you describe him? He worked very hard. He tried very hard. He always did his best. Would you uh, describe him as uh, motivated? <coughs> yes, perhaps for the wrong reasons, but highly motivated. Did Eric appear to you to be a fearful student? Yes. And uh, did you talk with him um, about his fears and what he was afraid of? I don't remember. Okay. Uh, what, what did Eric do or say in class that causes you to describe him as a fearful student? Uh, a few days before every test, it was inevitable that his hand would go up and say, should I write this down? And I would say, it's up to you. And then the hand would immediately go up again, and he would say, is it going to be on the test? When he did well, he was ecstatic. When he didn't do well, he usually cried. Was there anything unusual that would happen between uh, the time he took a test and the time he actually received his grade? Well, he would follow me around like a puppy dog saying, what did I get, what did I get, have you corrected the tests? Did, did uh, Eric Menendez appear to have any internal understanding of, of when he did well and when he did badly? No. When you, you said that Eric's behavior wasn't that unusual, what, what did you mean? A number of the children were very anxious to receive their grades, um, but he ranked right up there with, with the top two or three. Okay. Now, you mentioned uh, crying. Yes. Did Eric cry in class? When he received a poor grade. And when he cried in class, was this in front of the other ninth graders? Yes. And was this crying that, that you said happened when he received a bad grade, did that happen every time he, he received a bad grade? To the best of my knowledge. Um, Mrs. Sharp, was, was crying in class unusual behavior for a ninth grader? Objection irrelevant. Overall. Yes, for a ninth grade boy especially. Did uh, the other children in the class react <coughs> to uh, Eric's crying? Yes, they were very supportive because they were accustomed to this. Um, he cried in his other classes also. When you uh, knew Eric, he was about 15 to 16 years old, is that yes. right? In the records that are in front of you, um, exhibit number 199, could you take a look at the entry uh, for October of 1983? Do you describe Lyle as having far superior 
written skills than he did oral skills in your class? Yes. And did you ever uh, find out why that was? I'm afraid that would be guessing. All right. And in the uh, entry for November of 1983, which is the one right below the October entry, mm -hmm. do you indicate that there seems to be a time delay between questions that you asked Lyle and his ability to register the sounds? Yes, that's what I've written. And did you, uh, at that point, that is November of 83, recommend that Lyle have an auditory discrimination examination? That's correct. Do you know if he ever did that or the parents ever did that? I believe he did not. And did you said Eric Menendez expressed fear or was fearful. Was Lyle Menendez fearful also? Or yes. Or was he different? No, how, he was fearful. How was he fearful? He knew that he had to make certain grades to please his parents. And you described in your direct examination that Lyle was the favorite son. Did you mean by that that he was treated more favorably than Eric, or were you using that in some other way? To the best of my knowledge, he was treated with kid gloves, and Eric fell in second place. Anything Lyle did was to be perfect, and Lyle pretty much did what he was supposed to do. Did Lyle um, respond to your commands in class? Absolutely. W was, was that unusual in the way that he responded? A bit. He never questioned. He never challenged. Uh, he did everything I said uh, whenever I said it. Um, he, in fact, he was not even, at that particular point in his life, a, a creative child, an independent <laughs> thinker. He would do anything that I asked him to do. Um, because he was very courteous, but because he wanted to get a good grade. And what was his behavior like in class? He was wonderful. Was he quiet, talkative, one he, of the boys? How would you characterize him? He was a model student. Uh, he, had, he had a very good sense of humor, but he participated. Uh, he didn't like to get an answer wrong. Was he always happy in class? No. Did he ever express sadness in your class? Yes. How would he do that? If he didn't understand, or if he, which he rarely admitted, because he didn't want to do that, but if he if he received a poor grade, he was he was not happy. He was also not happy when I had to chastise him a number of times uh, for coming in late every single morning. We had an 8:20 class, um, and he was never on time. He would come in at about 8:35 in his tennis outfit, with his racket and his tennis bag. In fact, I don't think I ever saw Lyle Menendez at PDS in anything but tennis shorts, and ever. Did, did you, in June of 1984, in your comments, indicate that Lyle was having difficulty um, due to absences and athletic responsibilities? That's exactly what I've written, yes. Was that referring to his tennis practices? Yes. Was that interfering with his schoolwork, in your opinion? At yes. That More Eric. so than other students? Oh, yes. He had very, very expressive eyes, and, and they were they were frightening. Um, I wish I could do it, but he would look down at you so that you would have to look up at him, and it, and it was frightening. When he was speaking to me, he was referring to grades and that I better be the perfect teacher so that his son could get the perfect grade. And did he express that sentiment to you on more than one occasion or just the one incident you're Just that one about? time. And did Mrs. Menendez express similar sentiments? Uh, implicitly. Was she present when the statement was made? I believe so. Did she express any disagreement with her husband? She wouldn't dare. And you were asked um, for your evaluation on whether Mrs. Menendez cared for her sons, and you said, in your estimation, she did not. Could you tell us why? I can base that statement only what I saw at school. Um, but generally when parents came in to discuss their children at the conferences. Um, their concern was why they were getting the grades they were getting and what they could do to help. Um, when we gave the suggestions to most of the parents at PDS, because they had the resources, they took advantage of it and they helped their children. And in the case of these boys, they never got the help they needed. From a teaching point of view, and from a teaching point of view, how did it seem to you that she did not care for her sons? That she would not get them the help that they needed, or particularly Eric. He would have been 15 and something, right. I think. 
um, immature compared to the others. Okay. And is there anything uh, in particular about his behavior in class with respect to you uh, that um, makes you uh, tell us that he was immature compared to the other children? Some of the behavior, sort of clowning, uh, which some kids do but uh, is not necessarily seen as mature behavior. We met uh, with the, the building in which our class met is an old building and we met in the dining room of the building. It was not like a regular classroom and it had a big table mm -hmm. and we all sat around the table and Eric always sat right there um, for whatever reason. He seemed to want to feel secure. Okay, when you say right there, do you mean next to Right you? next to Okay, and uh, is is it your is it did that to you mean that, that Eric felt some need to be near you? What, uh, based on your years of teaching experience, uh, is there a particular phenomenon that is at work when a child seeks to be near a teacher, to be close to a teacher? What are these comments <coughs> that uh, we've been referring to? Every quarter, and in this case, I notice there are five, which we no longer have to do, thank goodness only four. Um, at the time that you give grades, you also write a comment assessing the student, uh, a, trying to give a verbal picture of where the student is at that point, making suggestions for improvement or praise for success. Did uh, you notice uh, any learning problems that Eric had early on in your contact with him uh, in 1985. I recall saying in that very first comment in October that I noticed he seemed to get flustered uh, taking written tests and that it was my observation that uh, he had a problem literally with the physical act of writing. Uh, it's a fancy term for it, is dysgraphia. Uh, he would have had to have been tested for that, which as far as I know he never was. But that his writing was quite bad and it was literally painful to do it. And I concluded that perhaps one of the reasons that he particularly got disturbed uh, at the time of taking a test was because of that. Now, let's get back to this, uh, the term that you said, dysgraphia. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is uh, literally a, a difficulty in putting, putting your thoughts to paper. Right, and in actually physically writing on the page. And you, you mentioned uh, that your first comment uh, was that he became flustered on tests. C can you tell us what you meant by flustered? Well, to me, flustered is sort of sweating a lot and scratching things out and having trouble concentrating while others are moving right along and perhaps not even finishing. Uh, did it appear to you that Eric uh, was a child with, with a high anxiety level with respect to his performance in school? I would say he was very anxious. Okay. And uh, is there anything else about his uh, behavior in class uh, that uh, makes you conclude that he was anxious, for example, his seating himself. That would certainly uh, be an example of it um, because a girl might do that, but it's unusual for a guy. Um, and the security, if you're taking a test and you're anxious, uh, would certainly lead to that. Um, being very worried about whether the assignment had been done right, taking a test and saying, Am I doing this right? Uh, and say, you know, we can't talk about that now. That kind of thing. He, he, he would say that? He would say, am I doing this right mm -hmm. during tests? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Okay. Now, Mrs. Stolfitz, did Eric seem to you to be uh, a happy child or a sad child? Eric struck me as a very sad kid. I never saw what I would call a sense of joy about him. You mentioned um, earlier that, that he was, uh, he used to clown around. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you reconcile your, 
description of him as a sad kid with his clowning around behavior? I would conclude that the clowning around was to get attention, to show that he was one of the kids, when in fact he had, as far as I could see, no particular buddies in that classroom. Okay. Um, did he seem to be lonely? Overall. He was a very alone kind of person, yes. Okay. Now, Mrs. Stolfus, have you uh, had a chance to review at some prior time the <coughs> comments that were written about Eric by uh, other teachers at Princeton Day School? At the time that I looked over my old ones, I also looked at comments written by my son and by other teachers. Uh, my son also teaches there. And I was struck by how often teachers referred to his anxiety. Did Eric appear to be under any pressure because of his following in his brother's footsteps? I would say absolutely. At faculty meetings, one discusses students, uh, and Lyle was regarded as the more achieving student. Uh, Eric made it very clear that he idolized his older brother, that this was somebody who was an academic wonder and an athlete of the first order. Did Eric indicate to you that he uh, wanted to emulate his older brother? It was very clear that he would love to achieve as his brother had. I said, I showed the papers and I said, you cheated, you copied this. How do you explain this? I may not have attacked like that. I don't exactly remember, but I said, how do you explain the similarity between these two? And his initial reaction was, you know, nothing. And then I said, you had to have copied this. And he began to cry. Okay. You say he began to cry. Yes. Uh, a few tears? No, he really cried. Okay. Was, uh, the crying that you saw uh, unusual behavior for a 15 or 16 year old ninth grader, even one who's just been confronted with a paper they copied? I have rarely seen a boy of that age cry over anything. What, what were your impressions of Jose Menendez based on the meeting that you had with him? I, I thought he um, had a very definite uh, sense of who he was. I, I thought he was very condescending. He didn't seem to have a very high opinion of teachers, especially women teachers. Just his um, general attitude. I, I couldn't say he said anything. It was just the, the manner in which he spoke to me. Were his expectations of his son, in your opinion, realistic? No. No, I, I don't think they were. Okay. Could you tell us about uh, Eric as a student? What type of student was he? Earlier in the year, I thought he was uh, suffering from a, a typical case of senioritis. Um, which means that there are frequent absences and work isn't handed in very often or very well, which is common with um, many seniors. Uh, it was very difficult to get work completed in class from him. Uh, written assignments were rarely completed if they were to be completed in class, but uh, homework assignments eventually I would get from him and the caliber of those assignments was much higher than anything he produced in class. Okay. And did uh, there appear to you to be some difficulty, some learning difficulty on Eric's part? It didn't occur to me until much later in the second semester that Eric had a reading problem and, and I really only noticed it because it's typical of uh, seniors especially to be able to compensate and to cover up for reading difficulties. Uh, there are all kinds of techniques that kids use to do that. But because it was a Shakespeare class, we did a lot of oral work and quite a bit of it was sight reading. And, and Eric liked to take part because he enjoyed acting. And I noticed as he was reading 
that he was substituting words for what was actually in the text, um, using the right beginning sounds, but making up another word uh, as he was reading. And uh, <coughs> that alerted me to the fact that he was having reading problems. Okay. Is there a particular name for the reading problem that you observed with Eric? Well, some people call it dyslexia. It did uh, it appear that, that Eric had to um, struggle to, to get meaning from the printed page? Objection calls for speculation. Oh, you can answer the question. In the sense that it might be new material and unfamiliar material, but as I say, because of his experience and, and the fact that he was a capable young man in many ways, he probably could make a guess at the real meaning as he was reading, but it would slow him down a bit, I think. Okay. Did you ever have a discussion with either of Eric's parents about his difficulties with reading? Towards the end of the second semester, Mrs. Menendez asked for um, a conference, and she came by herself that time, and I raised this point. I said I had the feeling that Eric had reading problems, that I hadn't noticed it as noticeably, but towards the end of the year, it was, I, I felt strongly that there was a problem. And she said, oh yes, we know that. We had him tested when he was younger and uh, we were told that Eric was dyslexic. And I said at the time, I wish you had said something when enrolling Eric in the school, we might have been able to help him. But I really don't think so because if it isn't handled early, by 12th grade, mm -hmm. there's probably not much that a school could do anyway. Okay. In other words, this, this reading dyslexia is something that you need intervention and remedial classes at a very early age. Yes, I would say so. Now, directing your attention to the years 1985 to 1986, did you have Eric Menendez in an English class at Princeton Day School? Yes, I did. I taught ninth grade English that year. I was um, concerned about his performance, um, so even though um, I did not worry that he was going to fail the course, um, I wanted to call to the parents' attention the fact that he was having difficulties more than normal. What sort of difficulties was he having? Um, Eric had trouble meeting assignment deadlines. Um, he often misunderstood the directions for assignments. Um, he um, sometimes did not do well on uh, quizzes, um, especially pop quizzes, quizzes that were unannounced. Um, he seemed to have trouble um, keeping track of when the class met. The class did not meet at the same time every day. And for my particular class, we did not even meet in the same place every day. I used a computer room for some writing and the classroom. And um, Eric was frequently late because he had gone somewhere else. I would often hand out in written instructions and then go over them orally or have uh, students uh, read and question um, the instructions. Um, and even with that double enforcement, um, he would not understand. Was uh, Eric a particularly anxious student that you, uh, is that something that you noticed during the first month that you taught him? Um, I mentioned that in the first uh, interim and in several others, um, and in several other comments, um, he uh, was anxious about, uh, clearly anxious about grades. Um, he would, um, I, I would refer to it as his um, having something that was getting in his way, and and um, I didn't know what. Eric, Eric was very good at some areas of English. I don't think he realized that he was good at those. He tended to see his weaknesses rather than his strengths. And many times it was um, his strengths were in um, non-graded areas, um, discussion, for example. When, when I would try open-ended assignments 
with the class, Eric, in his conference time, would need um, uh, a lot of help and reinforcement to get what it was he wanted to write about clarified. He just, he saw everything um, as potential, he seemed to see everything as potential danger. Um, he did not distinguish between a quiz or a test or a major paper. Everything was the same level of importance. He didn't, didn't have a very good sort of sense of where he was or the connectedness um, as far as procedure. Did Eric have any uh, basic skill problems that you noticed? Um, yes, he, um, in writing, um, he, he is a terrible speller, worse than I am. Um, he um, had a great deal of, pro of trouble with end punctuation, which is not usual for a ninth grader. He just didn't know he would write um, uh, numerous sentence fragments, um, run on sentences using a comma instead of a period, which is um, a little bit more common. Um, um, other punctuation was just, he couldn't get a hold of it. Um, he had some problems in sequencing. Uh, there seemed to be problems in his uh, processing um, material that was raised in class discussion, although he himself was good at, at class discussion. Uh, but, but drawing together the information from his classmates in an organized way or things that I would um, say, um, something broke down. Did you notice that Eric had any problems concentrating? Um, Yes, there would be, if the discussion was very rapid um, and if people only said a little bit and it moved um, quickly, um, he was right there and following. But if either I talked too long or, or uh, one of the other students talked too long, um, he would seem to drift away. And then in some, in some days, he seemed preoccupied. <coughs> Yes, um, if if it were um, a test that that he knew uh, was uh, summarizing a, um, an entire book, or if he were asked to um, take a quiz for which he knew he was not prepared, um, he would become very upset um, and um, um, he would cry. Okay. And that would be in class. Yes. Was that unusual for a ninth grade boy to cry in class? Um, yes, it's very, um, it's very unusual. Um, some ninth grade boys who are under the same or under similar uh, stress f situations will either um, be angry, explode in anger, or will leave the room. But um, most ninth grade boys do not cry, especially in front of their peers. And what about when Eric received a poor grade? Would that also prompt him to cry? Um, yes, and so what I tried to do in that, um, I, I assumed it, it was a kind of embarrassment. Um, yes, I um, would give him his papers back either before or after class. What specifically did Mrs. Menendez say to Eric? Um, she um, said that um, how could he do this to the family name? How could he um, uh, lower this family honor and uh, bring uh, disgrace upon the family? Um, which, to my mind, was not the point. But you're aware that Eric had an older brother named Lyle. Yes, I am. And Lyle also went to PDS. That's right. Uh, he he was two years older than Eric. Uh, he was a senior when Eric was a freshman. Mrs. Howarth, how did you first become aware that Eric had an older brother named Lyle? Um, everyone at school knew Lyle. Um, Lyle was a, a very good at tennis and brought. 
um, a great deal of positive publicity to the school. Um, and I taught um, Lyle at the end of his senior year, but before that I had heard, uh, had read quite a lot about Lyle um, in Eric's journal. What did Eric write about in his journal? Um, I would say 70% um, of his journal was about Lyle. Then there was entries about sports, a um, few other entries. And about sports, about soccer. Um, he was very good at soccer, and I asked him why he was not um, uh, concentrating his sports efforts on, on soccer. He was wonderful on the soccer field. Um, and he said, because Lyle plays tennis. And I, I, at the time, I thought, that's ninth grade logic at work that I don't understand. Uh, based on your uh, contacts with him, did he appear to uh, try hard to, to learn? I always thought so. Okay. Uh, did you notice anything, any difficulties with uh, Eric's attention span? Yes. And what did you notice? There were times when it was non-existent. Times when he was spaced out. Uh, he would look at me and look right through me. And uh, I would look at him and I realized there was nobody there behind the eyes. He was just not there. And other times he was in and sharp and brisk. And it would change in a matter of minutes sometimes. Was this behavior that you saw in Eric unusual in your experience? Yes. And would you do anything to try and get Eric's attention? Surely. I'd jump up and down and pound the table and make noise and shout and walk up and down and try different things to keep his focus on me. It was bad enough that other tutors in the same offices would pound on the walls and tell me to be quiet sometimes. Now, is in tutoring, did you ever uh, meet uh, Mrs. Menendez, uh, Eric's mother? Yes, I did. About how many times? A small number of times. Okay. And uh, did you have any, ever have any conversation with her about how Eric was doing or his progress? I attempted to after a session if she would be there waiting to pick Eric up or I would come over to her and begin to tell her how her son did. And I, I felt she had no interest. The time that he was, the half that he wasn't, was that because of this attention deficit that you've told us about. Right, the total lack of, you know, you go like this and there's nothing there behind the eyes. And that, that's, when he was sharp, he was a good student. 